Assalamu alaikum. Um, hello, greetings. I would like to first um, I pray to the Almighty to bestow upon me his truth, his wisdom, that I may be worthy of conveying his message and so sanctify his name. And then, inshallah, with the hope of the Almighty, with the help of the Almighty, to be able to uh, bring peace to the world. Uh, I first uh, would like to thank the, the uh, University College for uh, Rampo College for allowing us to come speak. The, uh, the Muslim Student Association, uh, Munira, president, for uh, arranging this. And uh, this is a we believe it is. It's a crucial. It's very important. Hopefully, this will be a window, an opportunity that the word should spread amongst the university students. And with God's help, it should be, uh, I hope that it will go on from here, that people should be able to study this subject. And um, with God's help, they'll come to the knowledge, the full knowledge that there is a whole different perspective to what they, you've been taught till today, in almost universally, about the issue of Palestine, about the issue of Israel, about the issue of all the Middle East, the Middle East conflict. And much more. Also, I'm hoping, with God's help, the students here will, with with God's help, will attain uh, uh, great uh, a great future to be able to be leading uh, many, many, may, maybe in the American society, maybe in the world as world leaders. And therefore, it's very really crucial to understand this issue. We hope that it won't take so long. We we pray every day to God that that uh, with, that today uh, will be the last day of this occupation. That is our uh, our fervent prayer to the Almighty. And uh, and I will explain why we as Jewish people pray for this and hope for this. My name is Rabbi Yisrael David Weiss. It is, I'm a, a Jew, practices of Jewish religion, as so many other uh, around the world, whether it is in Jerusalem and Al-Quds, or as we like to refer to say, it was in occupied Palestine, or around the world, wherever you will find a Jewish community, wherever they are truly religious, you will find the more the religious the community, the more they oppose not the actions of the state of Israel, but the mere existence of the state of Israel. And that's, of course, shocking to many people. Uh, as I was coming in, somebody, one of the security people, even came over to me and, with, you know, and said shalom and, um, and said he, he, he has from his community people living in Israel. I don't think he's Jewish. It didn't seem that he was Jewish, but they have people in the community there. And therefore, like, taking for granted that, that being that I'm a religious Jew, I would be in support of the occupation. But the truth is that it is entirely the opposite. The more the religious a Jew is, the more the religious the Jewish community is around the world, the more anti-Zionist, anti-occupation, anti-the existence of the state of Israel. And so basically because we are Jewish, we oppose the existence of the Zionist state of Israel. Let me explain the word Zionism. Zionism is a terminology referring to Zion. Uh, Zion is Tzion pronounced in Hebrew and it's referred to in the books of the prophets the city of David which would basically be Jerusalem, Al-Quds. And that's why they are called Zionists. The ones who created the Zionist state of Israel and the ones who support it are called Zionists because they refer to the like their center as Jerusalem, and um, and that's the idea of the occupation. Somehow that it is connected with the prophets and with the teachings of God, with the five books of Moses and the Jewish people. This concept of having a, a state of Israel, we refute that. With God's help, we we are clear, we state clearly, unequivocally, that the state of Israel is expressly forbidden. There is no way around this. It's expressly forbidden according to the Jewish law for the Jewish people to have a Zionist, to have the state of Israel. And the reason is 
is because we'll, we'll try to uh, preface this with a few uh, concepts of what Judaism is, and you have to just uh, uh, bear with me, and with God's help, you will understand, the, it will be clear, very clear after this explanation. Uh, Judaism is simply the Jewish people around 3,000 years ago made a covenant on Mount Sinai to to uphold the laws of the Torah, to uphold the, uh, the, the Torah that was given to Moses by God on Mount Sinai. The, that's the uh, five books of Moses, then there's prophets, and in this Torah it states that we have to be subservient to God. That is what Judaism is, and Judaism has not changed. It cannot change. In the books of the five books of Moses, we are constantly warned by God that we're not allowed to add or subtract one letter even from our teaching. The whole concept of what Judaism is to be subservient to God and to uphold the commandments, which is 613 commandments. It's many commandments. The Jewish people believe, this is the Jewish belief, not the Jewish people, the Jewish, Jewish religion is very clear to us that God created the world, that uh, every person was created by God, God rules the world, and he, and he uh, commands his, his, that all human, humanity has to believe that God gave Moses the Torah, which states that everyone has to keep the seven laws of Noah. In other words, we're all uh, descendants of Noah, and everybody has to keep the seven laws of Noah, that is to believe in one God, not to worship idols, not to kill, not to steal, not to commit adultery, and to have a court system in every country we're residing, and um, not to eat from an animal while it's still uh, shaking, even if it was uh, slaughtered. But if a person keeps the seven laws of Noah, they'll be, they are a righteous individual, they will inherit the world to come. You don't have to be Jewish to serve God. That's totally not the Jewish belief or the, in our religion. Judaism was simply that we made an extra covenant with God that we will uh, keep 613 commandments, this covenant we made on Mount Sinai. So again, as far as the Jew is concerned, all humanity, as long as they believe in God and don't worship idols, etc., they, they are not... They, they, they will inherit the world to, go, to come. You don't have to be Jewish. We do not encourage people to become Jewish uh, because it's many commandments. It's very complicated. But as a Jew, we have to strictly adhere to the laws of the Torah. We have not changed. The world has changed. Technology has changed. And we constantly, we, we, the scholars amongst us, uh, take each issue individually and see how it conforms the, 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 the daily life, how it conforms to the Torah, that we should be able to adhere to the laws of the Torah. That meaning, for instance, in the Torah, we are not allowed to use, it says on the Sabbath, we have to rest on the Sabbath to remember that God created the world six days and rested on the Sabbath. Um, therefore, we're not allowed to make fire, it says in the Torah, on the Sabbath, it's one of the Ten Commandments. So now when you have electric, or, um, so, or to use a car, so we're not allowed, we don't drive a car on Sabbath. We don't turn on the electricity on Sabbath. Why? Because the rabbis considered this, that it's fire. It has to do with fire electric. So therefore, it is forbidden for us. So that means, in other words, as the time changes, we conform ourselves to the Torah. We don't change the Torah. It's not, we cannot change the Torah. It's not ours. It was given to us by God. What is Judaism again? To be subservient to God. One of the issues that God commanded us when we went out of Egypt and we and 3,000 years ago and we took this covenant, we made this covenant with, with God, was to go into the Holy Land. God wanted us to go into the Holy Land and serve God in the Holy Land. But God warned us many times in the Torah that we should be careful because it is a very holy land. And although all throughout the world we have to serve God, but in the Holy Land we have to be on a higher, much higher level of, of, of holiness. And if not, then the land will reject us. Like a body rejects, uh, uh, if you want to make a transplant, they constantly have to give the, the person medication that the body should not reject the, the, this, uh, 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 this organ that was, that was put into the body. The same thing is with, uh, we believe the Holy Land is a place that we have, it's a very sensitive. We have to, and God warns us that we will be rejected from the land if we are not on this high level of holiness that's required. We were warned by the prophets if we went into the Holy Land. We were warned by Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah. We were warned many times 
that we are not on that level that's required to be, and God is warning us we will be rejected. And that came about 2,000 years ago with the destruction of King Solomon's temple, and then there was a second temple. In that time period, we were, we were, uh, we were sent out, we were put into, uh, the, uh, in, into exile, we were spread out throughout the world. And we were warned by God that we, sh- um, we were put on the three oaths that we should not attempt to return in mass in large numbers to the Holy Land. In other words, we believe we were sent out of the Holy Land as it's very, very uh, um, um, explained at length in in, in many, many uh, verses, many times in the books of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and so forth, that we we were spread out throughout the the world and we are are on the three oaths, which is a, these three oaths are the prophecy of King Solomon. And he made a book called Shir Hashirim, Song of Songs. And in this prophecy, we were warned we should not... God sent us into exile. We didn't go to exile because we were weak physically. We don't believe that it was because we were lacking in an army. We didn't have a backing of a country like the United States or something. It wasn't because of that that we didn't, uh, we didn't have a strong enough military. It was simply because of our sins that we were rejected from the land. And that is very clear. Every Jewish person who believes in God believes this and says that in his prayers. We say it every holiday, we say um, um, because of our sins we were sent, in, we, was, uh, we were exiled from our land. This is the basic Jewish belief. And because of that, we, th- there was a prophecy as King Solomon states three oaths of God. One, not to return in mass, not to return in large numbers as a as a, a movement, uh, like a nationalist movement. Secondly, we are not to rebel against any nation. That means we're not to, um, <clears throat> we have to be loyal in every country we're residing. Whether we are happy with the government, whether we're not happy with the government, regardless, they, they require of us, they, they put excessive taxation on the Jewish people, or they, they the other decrees against the Jews that they couldn't own land, which happened through Europe. Whatever it was, we had to pray for the well-being of that country. So whether we're living today, whether it's uh, um, United States or Canada or uh, Iran or uh, any country you'd like, Egypt, Lebanon, wherever a Jew is living has to be a loyal citizen in that country and pray for its well-being. That said, we were also warned by God, and it's in the books of it's in the book of Daniel, that if the king comes along and demands that we should stop observing the Torah, then then it stops. We do not obey them. Uh, the kings uh, demanded of, of, of Daniel that he should um, bow down to an idol. He said, when it comes to taxation, you are my king. When it comes to the issues of God, you and the dog are the same. It's a verse in Daniel. So basically, we, we are, um, as a Jew, we have three oaths that, uh, that uh, escort us through exile for these last 2,000 years. And one of the oaths, again, is not to, re- to return in mass. The second oath is that we should not re- rebel against any nation. And thirdly, we should not make any attempt to leave exile. We went through many trials and tribulations through these last 2,000 years. If anybody follows a little bit of Jewish history, you see we lived in Europe, in, in, in Spain, in Italy, in, um, in Portugal. There was the Inquisitions over there where Jews were, uh, they tried to force the Jews to convert to Christianity. We were burnt at the stake. Um, Jews were expelled from, um, uh, from Spain and Portugal and Italy. And even from England, there's York in England. Um, I went to visit over there. Um, uh, uh, maybe 600 years ago or something, Jews were um, expelled from England. I don't remember the exact date they were expelled. Jews, all Jews had to leave. But before they were expelled, there was a time they were living in York. And, um, and they, they, they t- bought protection from the government over there. The Jews, um, then all of a sudden a, a bunch of people came, and, they, they, and the Jews ran for protection into the fort, which is in the middle of the city. It's, it's a, there's an exceptional pictures. You can look it up, York, and there's, it's like a mound, a very tall mound, like a little mountain, a mound, and on top is a big fort, and on the bottom there's a big sign that says the Jews and Jewesses were, um, died, they were burnt over here, because they refused, they were warned, that they were told that they have to come out and convert. They refused, so they were set on fire. And it's a, there's a, this is part of our sad history in Europe. So Jews gave their lives to uphold the Torah. We've been doing it for 2,000 years, and we went through many trials and tribulations. Although we went through many trials and tribulations, we never attempted to leave exile because we knew that it's God's world. God is the ruler of this world. And he put us under oath, 
and we, th that we should not return and create our own sovereignty. Really, we're not allowed to create our own sovereignty in any part of the world. So there may be attempts to create a, a, a Jewish state in another part of the world. It would be also forbidden for us. So the Jewish people observed and upheld this, although they died for, their, for this, they, didn't, they did not make their own country, their own state, their own nationalist home. This was accepted amongst us for 2,000 years. Now, unfortunately, around uh, um, 250 years ago, there was a movement called Reform Judaism, and I'm sure you're all aware of that. What is reform? Exactly what it means. They're going to change the Judaism. They're going to reform. They're going to change the Judaism from what it was. Obviously, that's not acceptable. Because God gave us the Torah. He warned us we're not allowed to change one letter of the Torah. We've been observing this for 3,000 years. This is our life, it says, we believe. And, we, and to change it is, is in, impossible. So when they made the Reform Judaism, the, there was like a fatwa. That knows what like a decree issued from the great rabbis of Europe, because it started, Reform um, Judaism started in Europe, that... that we're not allowed to go into their synagogues or what they call them temples. We, we're not allowed to associate at all with them because they're basically um, a heretical movement and, they, and it has nothing to do with Judaism. That stays till today. In fact, the Reform are very frustrated because they're big supporters of Israel and a lot of times they're not recognized in the rabbinical court and so forth or even the Zionist court so that they have basically um, because the orthodoxy even the ones who unfortunately have lost a lot of their Jude Jewishness and they, 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 um, they've um, acclimated to Zionism unfortunately what they call modern orthodox which, uh, which is a euphemism it's uh, for meaning that they've, they've uh, um, compromised their religion their re uh, so still in all they cannot accept reform Judaism because reform means they're changing the Torah it's impossible they don't keep the Sabbath they don't keep the Ten Commandments but unfortunately, that started around 250 years ago, a little more than that in Europe, and it, caught, it became very popular. Jews were suffering a lot in Europe, and a lot of people stopped, stopped following their religion, and they started joining this Reform Judaism movement. So they became ignorant. Because they joined Reform Judaism, they didn't even know the Torah. They became a lot of communities were totally ignorant of the religion. They're, they only had certain things that were uh, emotionally favorable, that made them feel like they have certain Jewish um, issues they would go they would keep Yom Kippur, the Passover, certain parts of the Passover, different things they would go to the synagogue, they would have their, their clubs basically. Um, and then from them, their children, and from there mostly came from that, grew out a movement called Zionism. Because what happened was uh, this movement continued for 50 years, almost 100 years, and they saw that they were trying to become assimilated and accepted amongst the, the non-Jewish societies. They, they, they had organs and they um, in their synagogues, the temples. They did things that were totally not acceptable by Judaism. They decided they'll become uh, more educated, more, uh, af um, uh, more uh, uh, assimilated into the, the high society of Germany and so forth. And that way they'll be accepted and they'll stop being anti-Semitism. It totally didn't work. So there was the Dreyfus trial. I don't know if you heard of Captain Dreyfus. He was a uh, French uh, captain and um, in, in uh, the end of the 19th century. Um, and he was accused of espionage. And, it, and, and there was some uh, writer in, uh, who, who started the case. And, and he's decided that something's wrong here. It's fishy, the whole story. And he started delving into the case. And he realized that this captain who was accused of being a, a spy, it, he, he was Jewish. And the only reason they took him to be accused, because it was, they were trying to whitewash themselves. Somebody who was in a higher rank, who was, um, and he was a Jew. They took the Jew. And so he started writing against this. And everybody, it became a, a, the main topic in, in France. And, and, and all of a sudden, it started swimming up um, anti-Semitism. People started speaking about the Jews. It became a very, a very ugly subject. He, at the end, it turned out he was totally innocent, this Captain Dreyfus. But uh, there was somebody called Theodor Herzl at the time. He was a writer in, in, um, in Vienna, in Austria. And, he, and, and he, he said, look at this. We're trying to assimilate. It doesn't work. So let's try another, another, another uh, way to solve our problems. We're going to make our own state. We're going to be for ourselves. Nobody's protecting us. Nothing is working. We're going to make our own country, and we're going to be safe and sound. That's the way to solve all our problems. Basically, 
he ignored totally the words of the Torah, the words of Judaism that was the basics, that was accepted for now 3,000 years, that Jews gave their lives for. For 2,000 years we were burnt at the stake because for us, our body, you have a physical body. But every Jewish person believes that there's a soul and we have to serve God and the body is only a tool to be able to, to do the commandments of God. And therefore, we're ready to sacrifice our body, and that goal is, is a lot in order to keep our soul alive. We're ready to die for the, to be able to serve God. That's the first thing by a Jew. And we say it every day in, our, in the morning and at night. Um, Here is your God is our God. God is one. And we, tell, we teach our children that we have to die for this cause. And Abraham was thrown into the fire because he believed in one God. He didn't want to. So this is, this is what our life is all about. Zionism came along, and they t- totally... They have this shell, what they call Judaism, it's a new type of Judaism, it was based on reform, basically that as long as you, they have their, like this, Christians have their, their, their religion, they have their religion, but it has nothing to do with the Torah. They've, they've put, t- taken God out of the equation. And it's, so it's only like a movement, it's a, uh, they made it, so they decided it's a nationalism. And so they dropped the whole concept of what Judaism is. They still have the shell, the outer shell. They'll have their rabbis, they call them reverends or rabbis, and they'll dress as rabbis. They're totally ignorant, many of them, of the laws of the Torah, but they definitely don't uphold, uphold the laws of the Torah. And they decided they're going to make a state. Assimilation didn't work properly for them in Europe. They decided what we will do is another concept. It's actually, it's a 180 degree turn from that, because assimilation was to be, you shouldn't remember that with Jews. Zionism came along and they said, no, we're going to make our own state and prove that we're not less than anybody else. Just like the Italians have Italy and um, uh, uh, U.S. citizens have the United States and Canadians are uh, proud Canadians, we're going to show we have the best Olympic team, we have gold, uh, we win gold medals, they're constantly talking about they have Nobel Prize winners and this and that and they have one of the strongest armies and so forth. They're a proud nation. All of a sudden, the whole concept of what Judaism is to serve God, to be subservient to God, to keep the commandments, is totally not there. It, doesn't, it, it has no place. They ridicule it. In fact, they're constantly, proudly talking about that they're the one, only democracy in the Middle East. They're busy with the democracy. Democracy means, and they, can't, they flaunt this, that you don't even have to observe the Torah. If anybody reads the laws of the Torah, a Jew is responsible that the, their brethren, the, the sisters and brothers, everybody has to keep the Sabbath. If you would have gone to Palestine a hundred years ago, over a hundred years ago, and even less than a hundred years ago, they used to blow a horn before the Sabbath, and they would go around the rabbis in the streets and the, all the stores, all the stores would close. In Jerusalem, all the stores closed, I mean the Jewish quarters, before, like two hours before the Sabbath. There was no such thing that a store was open. There was no such thing that uh, horses or maybe there was cars even at that time already would go through the streets. And you can ask old people about this. They're still alive. People remember this. This was what Judaism is, to be subservient to God. And Zionism came along and they proudly announced that they, that they have a democratic society, you don't have to observe the Torah, yet they're Jewish, they, rep- they represent King David, they represent God and the Torah. It's totally, it, it, it's antithetical to what Torah is, what, what Judaism is, what 3,000 years of what we've been giving our lives for, it's totally uh, contradictory. There's no question it's contradictory. All the rabbinical authorities in Europe where Zionism was born, Theodor Herzl and his, co- uh, and his uh, cohorts were come, come, come from Eastern Europe, if you know. And, they, and they, like we put up a, compi- a book, uh, the rabbis speak out, the 130 years record of religious Jewish opposition to Zionism. Well before they even created the state, or they knew where they are going to create the state, the rabbinical authorities spoke up in opposition to this. Because... The whole concept of, 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 of what Judaism is not to have a piece of land. In fact, it's expressed, God foresaw that there will be Jews who will be weak in, in their um, acceptance of the Torah. They'll be from the suffering or whatever it may be. And therefore God warned us. God foresaw that there will be a people who want to make a national home. So they warned us. You have to be um, uh, loyal citizens in every country. So I do not rebel against the nation. Do not go up and mass to the Holy Land and try to recreate your state. So when Zionism came along and they, they made this movement a hundred odd years ago and they decided that they will go up and they're going to make a national home, what they were doing 
is breaching all the basics, the oaths of the Torah, the basics of what Judaism is, breaching the laws, what God commanded us, that we are not allowed to um, rebel against nations, that we are not allowed to return en masse to the Holy Land. We should not make any attempt to end exile. All these three oaths that God foresaw, there will be people who will be like this. And we, it was a prophecy, an open prophecy from King Solomon. And it's in the, uh, the Talmud which explains the words of the Torah, of the written books of Moses and the prophecies, clearly states that that's what it means. So the whole concept of Zionism was foreseen by of course by God and the, and the prophets and was written about. And therefore, universally, every single Jewish leadership around the world, Jewish leadership didn't mean uh, somebody who, hold, who owned a Microsoft or something like that. It, 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 Jewish leadership meant the rabbinical authorities because it's a religion. And, and every community was led by their rabbis. That was a fact of life. All the rabbinical authorities universally spoke up against Zionism. We have, again, we compiled the writings of rabbis, many from well before the state was created. I'm just going to mention maybe one, the Chofetz Chaim, who was, um, the Chofetz Chaim was the, um, t was, I'm, I'm mentioning him because he was the, uh, you may say, like the, he, one of the greatest codifiers of Jewish law. He was from 1839 and passed away in 1933. So he was before the creation of the state, which was in 1948. And he wrote about this concept of Zionism. Everybody, universally, anybody who knows anything about Judaism, everybody lives and breathes by his laws, uh, uh, the way he codifies the laws. And he wrote, uh, the Zionists are dead limbs of our people, which causes the entire body to rot. I'm only quoting one, of course, there's so much more. In other words, Zionism was looked at as something unacceptable, a rebellion against God. So this is in in th th this concept of of Zionism would be forbidden for other Jewish people, regardless if it would be in an uninhabited land, if it would be in a desolate land, if it would be in Africa in uh, some desolate desert that would be maybe um, allocated for the Jews to make a land someplace. It doesn't matter. The Jews could have paid for it. Uh, well above the uh, uh, the going uh, price for a land, and it would be given to them with uh, with uh, with with ceremony and you know and and, uh, and 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 joy. It would be forbidden for us to have one inch of Jewish sovereignty. Why? Because we, as a Jew, are in exile decreed by God. Therefore, the state of Israel, according to the Jewish religion, cannot be acceptable, even if the Palestinian people would say, "Oh, take it; it's all yours." Now I'm going to put this aside and go to, like they say, the elephant in the room. It happens to be that they didn't create the Zionist state in a land that was uninhabited, or like their mantra of Zionism was for many, many years at the beginning of Zionism, because there was no internet and there was no way of people to know. They used to say a land without a people for a people without a land. They used to claim in the world that it's a desolate land and therefore the Jews have no problem of, of, of settling there and the UN should give it to them. Because after all, it's a people without a land, the people who suffered so much, and you should give them the land. And therefore they said it's a land without a people, which is a blatant lie, and, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a tragic lie, because there were many, many communities. In fact, the majority of the people living in Palestine, and the areas around also, of course, the, in, in Palestine was uh, the Muslim community, and then there was, secondly, there was a, a Christian Arab community, and then there was a Jewish community, which is the third community. Again, the Jewish community was a very religious community, living there for hundreds of years, totally observant of the Torah and anti-Zionist. We have the writings of the chief rabbis of Palestine. Uh, we have, again, you can go to our site, NKUSA. Um, I have um, uh, compiled many things. We have the traditional Torah opposition to Zionism. We have um, compiled historic documents. So I, uh, a, we have, like, a, from the, in, the 19, in the 1920s, July 7, 1920, Rabbi Zunnenfeld was the chief rabbi of the Jewish community of Jerusalem, and uh, which was basically of the whole of Palestine. That was the uh, head um, community. And he met with the king of Transjordan, um, King Abdullah of Jordan, and he wrote also many um, articles, and they sent it in, in Arabic. It was written in the Arab newspapers, which many, some of them are, are brought down here, the historical documents, and traditional Torah opposition to Zionism, where they kept the kind of writing that they have no wish 
to um, to take over the ear of, of the Palestinian what's what's considered holy by them Al Aqsa Mosque. He wrote about Rabbi Zonenfeld. Um, we just became aware of uh, while I was here actually before they they found the newspaper uh, from J July 9th, 1897, the Gazette in Montreal. Uh, the title is "Got a, uh, Got a Black Eye." Um, a subtitle, a media, American Rabbis Condemn Jewish Palestinian uh, Scheme. Um, a statement from rabbis in USA, and it's quoting, we totally disapprove any attempts for the establishment of a Jewish state. This was in 1897. Just, so, you know, it constantly comes up like different, uh, uh, you know, quotes and things. But it's universally, as I say, the rabbinical authorities, all of them stated unequivocally, we are not, that's not what Judaism is, is we're not to have a state. Now, the, in Palestine, the Jews lived in amongst the Arab and Muslim communities. They lived in total harmony and peace. Not only in, in Palestine, the Jewish communities were in Iraq, were in Iran. I don't know if you're aware, Jews lived in Iran for over 2,000 years. They lived in Yemen for over 2,000 years. Um, they, they, we were living in every single Arab and Muslim com community, almost in every single community. We flourished. We flourished in those communities, and more than that, when the Jews were being oppressed and they were trying to be forcibly converted, they were, the, uh, uh, the Christians tried to forcibly convert the Jews, the Jews escaped to the, to the Muslim countries, they were embraced, they were given a home, and our communities flourished. You can go to Egypt, I went there, you can go to Iran, you can go to um, wherever you'd like, Lebanon, um, Jordan, you go and you find Jewish cemeteries over there from hundreds and hundreds of years that the Jews were amongst a religious Muslim communities. So it wasn't that they weren't practicing their religion and the Jews, the greatest rabbis, intellectuals, our greatest scholars, holy men, came out of these communities and our communities flourished distinctly religious Jews amongst distinctly religious Muslims or Arab Christians and nobody nobody uh, they, they uh, tried to abolish the Judaism there. There was, could have been, as in, unfortunately around the world where there's a difference of religion there could be sometimes there was some you know uh, um, um, uh, uh, strife but if you're going to look at some of the strife, and you look through the history of Europe, the Christian Europe, you're going to see a, 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 a terrible massacres and so forth. So, of course, we're not condoning, of course, any of these massacres. But to claim that the Muslims, because it was a Muslim society, therefore the, they hated the Jews, is abhorrent and a, a, a total a, a lie. It's totally false. So Jews flourished in all the Arab and Muslim lands. We grew... For hundreds and hundreds of years, we put out, as I say, the greatest scholars, and we enjoyed a hospitality that was exemplary, including in Palestine. We lived in Al Quds in Jerusalem. I have many relatives um, uh, who are living in Jerusalem. Uh, they, they, and they are still today. Even there's many, many of our com uh, members of our re religious communities. They're living throughout occupied Palestine that were living there for hundreds of years, literally hundreds of years, and they were anti-Zionist, they were living, um, you know, in other words, they, were, they, they, were, they weren't for this nationalism, they were simply basically religious Jews, and when Zionism encroached on, upon Palestine, because they decided to create their state in Palestine, the Jewish community stood in opposition, in vehement opposition to this occupation. Again, Jews lived in the same courtyards as, as the Muslim people. They babysat each other's children. The most precious thing a, a person has is their child. And the mothers entrusted their children when they went to synagogue. They entrusted their children with the, with the Arab neighbors. The Arab neighbors entrusted their children with the Jewish neighbors. They lived as brothers and sisters. I went to Yemen. Um, um, we would travel. We would travel to Jewish communities that was closed off from the Zionists until they opened the doors, like maybe 30 years ago. But it was totally sealed because they were anti-Zionist, and yet they let the anti-Zionist Jews go there because we were able to prove to them that we're not Zionists. And we secretly we went to Yemen for maybe 40 years in a row. We went every year, and we went to visit Jewish communities. And when we would come, the Arab neighbors used to stroll into the houses of the Jews and sit down with us. It was like a brotherhood. They they sat together. They they. Uh, um, chew their gat, they, 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 um, um, they smoke their hookahs over there, they, they, they sit together, it was, it was total peace, it was each local uh, 
area had the sheikh who protected the Jews. This was the history, the narrative of Jews and Muslims living together. So it's clear, if it would be an issue that Jews and Muslims cannot live together, then it would have exploded. Jews would have been massacred in all these Arab lands and in Palestine when it was under the Turkish, um, 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 the Ottoman Empire. But that's not the case. On the contrary, we lived uh, um, and, and, and uh, flourished and grew and uh, continued to live peacefully for hundreds and hundreds of years under the Ottoman Empire and together as distinct Jews amongst distinct um, Muslim people. Now all of a sudden, a movement started a hundred odd years ago called Zionism, which was a transformation from religion into nationalism. In fact, they made their first um, a meeting in Basel, Switzerland in the 1890s. You have to look, you can, you can look it up. Uh, the first um, uh, Zionist Congress. You look at the picture over there of that, uh, that Congress, that meeting, and you'll see something that, uh, that's shocking. This, of course, it's too small, but you look at it. It's the, um, uh, the first Zionist Congress in, in, in Basel, Switzerland in 1897. You'll blow up the picture. You'll see there's nobody with covered heads. The whole top row and, and, and amongst the people, you won't find people covering their heads. This is supposed to be a Jewish Congress. A Jewish Congress means to be subservient to God. Every Jew, it happens to be in our law books that we have to cover our head to believe that there's a king above us. And, they're, and, it, and yet they're sitting there creating a supposedly uh, a, 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 um, a, a national Jewish home, uh, a, a historic event. They're going to take back the Jews who are suffering 2,000 years and they make a national uh, Jewish Congress supposedly to create, recreate a Jewish home, a Jewish state. And yet they're all sitting there with their heads uncovered. They're totally anti-religious. They made their, uh, um, uh, what would be their declaration of independence. They didn't even put God's name into it. And they had a fight with some religious Jews. How could you not put God's name? At the end they had Sur Yisrael, the stone of Israel, as a compromise. They didn't want to put it. They hated God. Theodor Herzl, in his writing, and he has a, his diary, and again, it's in the Torah, uh, traditional Torah opposition to Zionism, historic documents we wrote. You can look it up in his diary. It's page, um, uh, page 14 in his diary, and he's, I'm quoting him. Theodor Herzl was the father of Zionism, the, the, the one who's the creator, one of the, the basic creators of this uh, concept of creating a Jewish home. And he writes, the way to solve the problem of anti-Semitism is, um, again, again, I want to preface that, that it, was, it was right after the Dreyfus trials. It was at that time when there was a lot of anti-Semitism. People were openly spoke about their anti-Semitism in France and so forth. And they saw that reform, assimilation is not working. They decided to create a Jewish state. So they wrote, the way to solve the problem of anti-Semitism is to speak to the head priest of Vienna, to get an appointment with the Pope, to make a mass conversion of all the Jews of Austria to Catholicism. Imagine, we're talking about the heads of the Zionist state of Israel, the proud Jews, that they have a, a rabbinate and a chief rabbi, this big forest that they show the world. Yeah, they're representing Judaism, they use the Star of David, they're all, they're representing Judaism, the menorah, and this is what he writes, the concept. The way to solve the problem of anti-Semitism is to speak the headpiece of Vienna to get an appointment with the Pope to make a mass conversion of all the Jews of Austria to Catholicism. It should be done on Sunday in the middle of the day with music and pride, publicly. We are the last generation that held on to the faith of our forefathers. The conversion will be in St. Stephen's Cathedral. Uh, quote, just one more, Jabotinsky was, the, was also one of the fathers um, later when they, um, uh, like there was the, the Haganah, there was the, um, there was the Ergun, there was different movements, there was a more radical, more violent. Jabotinsky was the founder of revisionist Zionism. And he wrote in the paper, a newspaper that was called the Oretz, which is, people know of it, it was 1919. In the, the title of the article is from the outside the camp. In uh, October 22nd, 1919, he wrote, in the national home, we will announce that those Jews who have on themselves the rust of exile and they refuse to shave off their beards and the earlocks, or payas we call them, will be second class citizens and not have the right to vote. Jews who have a beard and payas will be second class citizens and have the right to vote. So understand what we're dealing with here. This is supposedly a Jewish state. And they go around the world and they tell the world that we as Jews have suffered so much, help us 
We, want our, we have a religion. We've suffered throughout the ages, 2,000 years in exile. We want our country. We want our land. And people have sympathy. People are good-hearted. They have sympathy on the Jews. They want to help them have the homeland. And imagine what they're saying. Jews with beards should not have a right to vote. Jews who are upholding their religion should not. So understand the farce, the hypocrisy of what we're dealing with. This is not a Jewish state. It's a movement, it's a political entity, a flawed, selfish political entity was created by a group of people who had an idea they wanted a national home. And in order to be able to get the backing of the world, to, in order to be able to get the support around the world of the world leaders and the uh, evangelistic Christian communities and so forth, they presented themselves as representing God and the Torah, representing the Jewish religion, and you should support them. Why? Because it's a Jewish state. We were 2,000 years in exile, the temple was destroyed, we've suffered so much. Help us now to return and uh, fulfill the dream that every Jew dreams of, to return out of exile. There's nothing uh, more, more repugnant than taking somebody else's identity that we died for. For 2,000 years, we, burnt, we were burnt at the stake to uphold our religion. My grandparents were killed in Auschwitz. We died for our religion. And they're turning around and using our identity because they want to have a club. They want to have a national home. And it's their political agenda, their political idea. And you have to support them because if not, you're anti-Semitic. And you're continuing what the Nazis did. And the fact that there happen to be Palestinian people there, that just happens to be a technical problem to this cause that they've had. So what they did was first they tried to tell the world that it was a land without a people for a people without a land. And then they, they saw that it wasn't working too well because the Palestinians kept on coming and saying, it's out, we're living here, how could you do this to us? So they started saying, oh, they're anti-Semitic, they hate the Jews. And the Muslims hate the Jews. There's not, again, how, how vile is that? The Jews are required to show gratefulness for good that has been done to them. It's a requirement of the Torah. We were suffering by the Inquisition, by the Crusades, and who opened the doors and embraced us? The Muslim and Arab countries. And we flourished there. Nobody could refute the, the Jewish communities that were living there hundreds and hundreds of years. And yet, they turn around and they say because there's an ingrained hate from the Muslims to the Jews. How dare they say that? I've been in Egypt. I've, I've gone, in fact, they created the Ring Road. I don't want to get into small topics of this. It's not a small topic, but they needed, there was terrible traffic jams. They created like a highway to go circle uh, Cairo. It's called the Ring Road. And it had to pass through a Jewish cemetery. So what they did was they built it for millions of dollars on stilts. It should not disturb the graves of the Jewish people. The Zionists, when they decided to, uh, uh, to widen their Kavush 6, it's called their main highway, Kavush 6, they cut through the Jewish cemetery, destroyed the cemetery. Because I, I, I didn't mention that the Zionists, when they decided originally were looking someplace convenient to make their national home. So they were thinking about Uganda or Patagonia. They were thinking of different areas to create their Zionist homeland because they were looking for something productive, a land that was productive, a, 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 a rich land. Um, but, but, but it turned out they realized that you need massive backing from world support in order to be able to support a creation of a national home. So they decided instead of just taking a lush land like Patagonia or Uganda, they're going to go to Palestine, even though it was a much, uh, much less inhabitable, it was a dry land and so forth, there was a lot of work had to be done, but they'll go to Palestine and they'll be able to sell this around the world to the evangelistic Christians and say, see in the Torah, it says the children of Israel were given the land of Israel. Israel and you should support this and they are millions and millions of evangelistic Christians support them because it says in the Torah they, they believe in the Bible it says that God gave the Jewish children the, whole, the Holy Land and they, it's for them it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, they have, they, it's maybe imperative or it's part of their belief to, to support this even though these guys were, 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 are, are, are charlatans because what were they? They were not religious. They weren't out there to serve God. They were going to breach the laws of Sabbath. They were going to, which they do. The stores are open on Sabbath. It's, one's, it's considered one of, the, one of the cardinal sins not to observe the Sabbath because we believe God created the world six days and seventh day he rested. To, to work on the Sabbath is like you're showing that God didn't create the world. It's considered one of the worst sins. And they do everything is open on Sabbath. They do everything, they have no 
no respect for the Jewish law, for God's law. Yet they walked around the world and say, oh, we're returning to the land that God promised us. It's Eschal to the Geula, the beginning of redemption. That's what they call it, the beginning of redemption. And the, we were warned in the three oaths not to make any attempt to end exile. They openly say they're the beginning of redemption. So the Zionism, what they're doing here is they've made a facade of Judaism. They, instead of respecting the chief rabbis of Palestine and the Jewish communities, the rabbinical authorities, they created their own rabbinate. They created their own rabbinate um, uh, and they made a chief rabbis and supposedly they told the world that, and the world looks at them as the, their, their rabbinate and the chief rabbi's representation of Judaism. Our chief rabbi in 1947, who was representing the Jewish community, and this is in the United Nations documents, and it's in the, um, we have uh, um, one of the pamphlets on the table in the back, you can take it, um, and you'll find it over there, it's um, Torah... Authentic Torah view of the state of Israel in general and of Jerusalem as its capital. It's in the back over there. You will see a quote. This is from United Nations documents and the pictures are there also. It says, We furthermore, Rabbi, this is Rabbi Yosef Tzvi Dushinsky, who was, um, after the 1920s, Rabbi Zonenfeld had passed away, who I mentioned before was the chief rabbi. Rabbi Yosef Tzvi Dushinsky was the chief rabbi at that time of Ashkenazi community. And he, and he went with a, a, a delegation to meet with the delegation of the United Nations that had come to, the, to, to the Palestine to discuss creating a state. This was 1947. The state of Israel was ratified by the United Nations in 1948. In 1947, July 16th, 1947, the chief rabbi Dushinsky, of blessed memory, pleaded in front of the United Nations delegation. He said, we furthermore wish to express our definite opposition to a Jewish state in any part of Palestine. Again, he's, this is a, a very religious rabbi. If it would be the will of God, how does, does he go when, when the United Nations is, is ready to bequeath and give the Jewish people their dream of 2,000 years old? He goes representing these Jewish communities of hundreds of years of Jews in Jerusalem. And he pleaded with them, we furthermore wish to express our definite opposition to a Jewish state in any part of Palestine. End of sentence. No, we want it this way or that way. No Jewish state. And since then, the Jews have been standing on the streets of Jerusalem, protesting this Zionist representation of them, the existence of the state, and they're being brutally beaten. You, you have to see the pictures. It's, it, it's one of the greatest scandals. The world does, it just totally ignores. You see, religious Jews, if this would be done in Moscow, if it would be done in any place else, in, the, in, in, in Times Square, in, in, in um, wherever, Trafalgar Square, I mean, it would be the, the, for, the front page of every newspaper. Everybody would be talking about them. Yet they constantly, day in and day out, brutally beat the religious Jews, and we're not armed. Nobody could accuse us of being armed. We never carried guns. And, and the, you never see that, they, you'll never see that they say that a Jewish uh, uh, anti-Zionist Jew killed a, a, a Zionist soldier, although we were beaten and assassinated our rabbis. You can, we can have lists of rabbis who were assassinated from the 1920s. We had a Dr. Dahan. There's a monument of him in Denmark. He was close with the king of Denmark. He moved, he was a, a scholar, uh, Dr. Yisrael Dahan, and he went to Palestine. He thought it means to become a good Jew was to go to Palestine, become a Zionist. And he was embraced by the Zionists in the 1920s. He went and he was a very serious person. The king of, of Denmark escorted him out of Denmark when he went to Palestine. Again, there's a monument from him. He was a poet, he was a, a, a diplomat, he was a, a very gifted person. He went to Palestine, was for a brief time together with the Zionists, and then he became aware that the Jewish community, who were truly Jewish, religious Jewish, were anti establishment a state. So he became close with the chief rabbi the Shin, uh, um, Zonnefeld that I mentioned in the 1920s and he said to him, the, fa the world doesn't know what's happening here. I am going to go to parliament. I'm going to go in 1920. And he started representing the Jews that they shouldn't be, because they were requiring of the Jews, the British, that the Jews have to be under the auspices of the Zionists. He said, and he fought that the Jews shouldn't have to be under the auspices of the Zionist leadership. Because at that time, Britain this was after World War I, was putting the Jews, it was under British mandate. They wanted every Jew should be, uh, that should be under the, uh, the rule, under the control of the Zionists. Imagine, a Jewish community was there hundreds and hundreds of years. A, no, a movement of non-religious Jews, people who are transgressing the Torah, irreligious, who are considered heretics. And all of a sudden, every Jew has to register under them. Dahan, Dr. Dahan of blessed memory, God should uh, avenge his blood, stood up and got us 
uh, extracted from this deal of Britain, and then he said, I'm going to go to Parliament. Those Haganah, they warned him that they're going to kill him. They're going to assassinate him if he attempts, if he's not going to be still. They, cut, they shot him in cold blood Haganah in front of the um, uh, um, Sharetzian Hospital in 1924. You can see the pictures of, his, um, uh, uh, of, of the procession, his funeral procession, of tens of thousands of Jews. The, the Jewish community all went um, to, to escort him to his final resting place. And since then, he didn't say, I'm going to go shoot anybody. And so since then, Jews stand out and demonstrate because that's the power is in our voice. We stand out on the streets and demonstrate. And the, here you can see the driving with horses, trampling Jews, smashing their heads. They drive them with cars. You can see this. They, 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 old rabbis, young people, children. You can see look, the crowds. Again, this is not a place that you can see this gold tower site. You can see women. Tens of thousands of Jews demonstrated. Here we took up the last chief rabbi in, in, in um, 02, after the other one passed away. Um, and and um, you see over 100,000 people going out to greet him. This is the movement that we have. You go to Canada, you go to the UK, here in New York. The largest religious communities, they live right across from Manhattan, for instance, in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Tens of thousands of Jews. If you go to Williamsburg, Brooklyn, there's not one single Israeli flag. If you go to Stanford Hills in London, that's where the most religious community is, there's not one Israeli flag flying. Why is that? Because the more one is religious, he knows his Jewish religion, he's true to his Jewish religion without compromise, he will not accept the existence of the state of Israel. We cry with the people of Palestine, we feel their suffering. As Jews, we have, we, our rabbis lament constantly, Der Yassin, the, 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 the terrible tragedies that have befallen the Palestinian people, that the, the, the Zionists came, and in order to gain control, so the first thing was they, they intimidated and they drove people out of the homes and they claimed the homes are empty. What they, we, we as Jews, uh, we went, many of our rabbis, many times throughout uh, the, this long sad history of the Zionist control, we went, um, uh, we, we went to uh, different Arab towns, Arab leaders, as I mentioned in the 1920s and in 1947. And also, furthermore, we, then when, when they created the Palestinian Authority, we had our rabbi who represented us in the Palestinian Authority, Rabbi Hirsch of Blessed Memory. And, um, and what the Zionists did was they poured acid in his face. He lived in Jerusalem, he was blind in one eye. He passed away like two, three years ago. Um, the boys and girls, there's, there's a mandatory service in their army. We refuse to serve in their army. Our boys and girls are beaten, they're arrested. Today, there's girls sitting in prison there. Boys and girls, children you can see, they're brutally beaten. It's scandalous. This is ongoing. There's no reason, there's no, there's no excuse for this. And yet the world is silent. Again, it would happen only once in another community. Why is it like that? Because people confuse the concept of Judaism and Zionism. So they think it's like some, uh, uh, something, uh, uh, a domestic dispute or something going on here. A domestic dispute, so you, people don't mix into this. It's too complicated. And if they're going to get involved in this, then you're anti-Semitic. So now we had um, uh, in England, um, there are people um, uh, um, who's being accused of the leadership over there. Or it, it, you, you would have Emmanuel Macron in France, the president, who, who said that anti-Semitism is anti-Zionism anti is anti-Semitism. You have laws here in the United States that are being passed that, that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. It's, 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 it's mind-blowing. How could they say that when you have the most religious communities here in the United States? that are anti-Zionist. The people we died, our families, we all, most of our families were people who died in Auschwitz. We know what anti-Semitism is. How could they do this to us? How could they put us into the same basket of Zionism and then after we, after we automatically we are sort of responsible for the actions of what the Zionists are doing. We cry with the suffering of the Palestinians. We went to Gaza. We went a few times to Gaza. We brought medical aid and so forth. We went and we have, and, and our rabbis in our synagogue speak about this. We go, we stand together with the Palestinians and demonstrate because they're suffering day in and day out for not since 48. 
but from the beginning of the 20th century at least, the Zionists started coming up and insidiously, certainly sometimes they bought land, but they, but because the Zion, the Arabs didn't know that when they're buying land, they thought it's just like Jews who bought land for hundreds of years. They didn't realize this is a movement with a plan to take over the land. And when they started realizing it, they, 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 they refused to sell. When they refused to sell, or even without them having to refuse to sell, they simply the Zionists came and intimidated. Or they went to Darius in a peaceful village that was living in total harmony with their Jewish neighbors and murdered them. And so they did to hundreds of other Arab villages. Our rabbi, we are humiliated in our communities. We are frustrated because our voices are not heard. We've been demonstrating from day one till today. We stand on the streets and demonstrate. We are accused, of, being, of course, by the Zionists of being uh, um, self-hating Jews. How ridiculous. What does it mean a self-hating Jew when we are the ones who proudly observe the Torah openly? We don't hide the fact we're Jewish. We keep the Sabbath. We are the ones who created Hatzalah, Hatz the free ambulance movement around, in the, in the, in, around the world it is already today. We go to hospitals, we have Dikr Cholom, visiting the sick, not only Jews, but um, other people who have needs. We have all the organizations started, we are flourishing Jewish communities. When they're busy about their numbers are dwindling, we are, our numbers are rising. We are proud of our Judaism being subservient to God. Yet they dare call us self-hating Jews. They ridicule us of being fringe. We're fringe, we come to our communities. I mean, go to all the, many, in, in, in all the different, um, um, uh, in every field, you have, um, uh, there are anti-Zionist Jews, they, they, our communities are flourishing, respectable communities. We have one issue, Zionism is not acceptable. Occupation is not acceptable. And the Torah it says, thou shalt not steal. Beside the issue of we're not allowed to have a state, like I said, there's the elephant in the room. The concept, we're not allowed to have a state even if we'll be in an uninhabited land. But to take the land from others and then the Torah states clearly, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. We have to show gratitude for the Dantas on top of all of that. How dare they occupy and steal the homes of Palestinians and vilify the Muslim people around the world and call them anti-Semitic. When, when you want to make in universities um, call rabbis to speak about anti-Zionism, People are fearful, they're intimidated, they're afraid they'll be accused of being anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitic? I'll tell you what anti-Semitic is. Anti-Semitic is when you walk around the world and laugh at the suffering of the Palestinians and create a rift and a hate of the Muslims to the Jews. When the world goes around thinking that every Jew, when I go to France or I come here, I go to any place and, I, and people um, um, uh, look at me with, with distaste, with hate, because they think that I'm part and parcel of the ones who are occupying another people and, and celebrating it. When they go to Jerusalem and decide to, to call the United States Embassy in Jerusalem, although it, it's not, it, it doesn't, we wrote a letter to the President that the fact is the state of Israel is a rebellion against God and it's not a Jewish state. But still in all, we pleaded with him. You're pouring salt on a wound. You're hurting the people of Palestine. You're hurting the Jews of Palestine. We are around the world. And when you go to another country, and I've had experience, Many people, and my experience in the Muslim countries was superb. People are, uh, respect us and talk about the warmth we've had for hundreds of years. Yet, no, so it, it happens on occasion when I went to, um, uh, in, in Europe, different countries, and people attacked us, yelled at us as being a Jew. Why? Because what Zionism has created. Zionism has created a hate for the Jews because what they're doing, and I'm talking because, not because there is that, as if there was never anti-Semitism, or there's no such thing as anti-Semitism even without Zionism. There is anti-Semitism. But Zionism is the greatest exacerbator of anti-Semitism around the world. There's, a two, um, there's a one and a half billion Muslims and they're Ummah, they know to protect one the other. And you come along and, and they think, and the Zionists walk around with their chief rabbi, with their rabbinate and tell the world that they are representing the Jewish people. And you don't hear the Jewish voice that opposes them, so then they automatically think that the more religious a Jew, the more they support it. They can walk around the streets with their heads uncovered, beard, with their, with their not dressed modestly, not to dress as a Jew. And they don't care because they'll get up in the parades with their police protection and say they're Zionists and laugh what's happening in Palestine. And then they'll walk on the streets and nobody will know they're Jewish. We walk on the streets around the world and everybody sees we're Jewish. And then people accuse us of perpetrating this crime against the Palestinians. That is anti-Semitism. They are creating anti-Semitism and causing our bloodshed. How much blood has been spilled because of the will to, 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 uh, to uh, perpetrate the existence of the Zionist state of Israel? How much 
People have to be slaughtered on the altar of Zionism. It's a land, you're trying to, you're having a state, a homeland, against the will of the majority of the people that were living there. The Palestinian Muslim community, the Palestinian Christian community, the Arab neighbors. They're coming as interlopers, they're coming in as a, a foreign a, 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 a movement of people and demanding that they should have the control. And people die because of that. So the Zionists say, oh, this will pass, there'll be the 67, um, uh, there'll be the Oslo Accords, and this and that. Every 10 years it doesn't pass that there's not a major war, and more bloodshed, and more bloodshed, and more bloodshed. We're not condoning the bloodshed. But every action brings a reaction. If you're going to go and oppress the people, they're going to respond. What do they expect when you take people and make checkpoints, and people are waiting on the lines, and that people are pregnant, and people have to have dialysis and medical treatment, and they have to wait for hours on the line, and some young whippersnapper, somebody 17 years old, stands there with a gun and laughs at an old man, and takes his respect away from his family, and says, you wait, and then they close it for the day, the, the checkpoint. How much could people suffer and not expect the result? Again, we're not condoning the violence. But if it would be done and if the Chinese would come and take over Rhode Island, say so you have so many other states, what's the big thing? We only need one little property here. Every American would stand up and, and, and oppose them. We're not saying that's the way. God forbid more bloodshed. But, but, to, but to claim that there's innocence in this occupation, they are the ones, their hands are covered in blood. Muslim blood, Christian blood, Jewish blood, Palestinian blood. They're creating, exacerbating anti-Semitism around the world. And then they put pressure on the leaders of the world, who some of them understand it, some of them maybe didn't delve into the issue, and they get the backing of the, palace, of, of, of the, of the Zionist movements, that they have powerful movements. Nobody's, nobody is accusing them of being inefficient. That they are. They have APAC. So every single politician, Democratic, Republican, has to bow on the, to the altar of Zionism and come show their support. Why? They, they, they come here and they, and they say anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Why is anti-Zionism anti-Semitism? When our blood is being spilt because we refuse to serve in the army, how many Jews, tens and tens of thousands of Jews are dying, they're standing there, they're demonstrating day in and day out that we don't want a Jewish state. We pleaded with the United Nations, it's the records. Why could they say that against the will of the United States citizens, the most religious community? Something is wrong here. So we plead with, the, with, with uh, people around the world to, to understand this. I mean, this, the issue about speaking against the Zionism, hopefully in the United States and other lands, which goes, it flies in the face of democracy, of free speech. But we plead that people should, be, um, should understand. I mean, this is just a window, an opportunity for you to follow. There's so much more in our writing. We could, tell, uh, I, we could delve into the, the time of the Holocaust. Um, I just mentioned the first president of the Zionist state of Israel. Um, we have books about this, and there's many books about this, how the Zionists colluded with the Nazis, how they, they, they impeded the, the, the safe, the, uh, the, uh, the, to save the Jews. There's facts on the ground. We have the facts. I'll just quote uh, from the first president of the, of, of the state of Israel, Chaim Weitzman. That was the reason why Britain actually gave the, the, the Balfour Declaration and so forth. I'm going to just have to quote from him so you should understand how you're being duped. The world is being duped. This is in um, a quote, I just took it one many, many places where he's quoted. It's, uh, this is the Jewish press, a, a Zionist uh, a newspaper from uh, October 1802. And this is a quote from Chaim Weitzman in a meeting that he had with Zionists in 1938, I believe this was. He wrote, the Palestine cannot absorb the Jews of Europe. We want only the best of Jewish youth to come to us. We want only the educated to enter, to enter Palestine for the purpose of increasing its culture. They were talking about that Jews are, are in a great danger in Europe, and should they try to help all these Jewish communities come up to Palestine? They wanted to build up Palestine. So he said he was afraid of Jews like us. He was afraid of these religious Jews because they knew that we're blatantly anti-Zionists. So he said, Palestine cannot absorb the Jews of Europe. We want only the best of Jewish youth to come to us. We want only the educated to enter Palestine for the purpose of increasing its culture. He didn't mean educated in rabbinical writing. He meant the lawyers and doctors. The other Jews will have to stay where they are and face whatever fate awaits of them. These millions of Jews are dust on the wheels of history and may have to be blown away. We don't want them pouring into Palestine. We don't want Tel Aviv to become another low-grade ghetto. 
This is the first president of the Zionist state of Israel who's busy making Yad Vashem and all these organizations to remember the Holocaust and remember what was done to the Jews and how they are with trying to save them. And if it wouldn't be a Zionist state, if it would have been a Zionist state, then we could have had been saved. These guys are, 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 are the real haters of, of the Jewish religion and of Jews who observe the Torah. They, they stood in the way of saving them. There's a book called Perfidy from Ben Hecht. There's a, um, our great rabbis who stood and tried to get the Jews saved. Well, well were impeded by this, by the Zionist movements. We have much of this, many rights. I, I was told to speak in house, I'm not going to, I'm going to stop it here, but, but there, we, there's a lot of documentation. I want you to know that Great Britain, Great Britain offered that in India, and in Mar Meridius Islands, they were going to take in the Jews without any documentation, and there is a documentary written about this, Sugihari it's called, where they, they offered to take in all the Jews without any documentation. Japan offered to take them in. And, um, and, and in this book of Holocaust of Victims Accused, you can see that the, over 100 parliamentary signatories wrote that they're willing to help to take the Jews out and to take them into the, um, the, the India and into Meridius Island. They were going to take them in without any documentation. And the Zionists came to Parliament and they said they want them only to go to Palestine because they wanted Palestine to have cannon fodder. And they stopped the motion in Palestine. In, 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 um, and this was written by, um, in the Times of London, 1961, by Rabbi Dr. Z Solomon Schoenfeld, who served in the period of the Holocaust as the chairman of the rescue committee. And he wrote this, because England was being accused at the time of being uh, silent at the suffering by the time of the Holocaust. And he wrote, my, my experience was totally the opposite. There was 277 parliamentary signatories at the parliamentary meeting in 1943, when the next step was being pursued by over 100 MPs and lords in parliament in the House of Lords, a spokesman for the now Zionists announced that the Jews would oppose the motion of saving the Jews on the ground of its admitting to refer to Palestine. The Zionists are ready to, say, to, to, to give the lives of, of anybody on the altar of their Zionist agenda simply because it's an idol for them. They don't, they don't respect God, they don't respect His laws. It's a facade they masquerade in order to intimidate as Jews, we cry with the Palestinian people. We see their suffering. We've gone to Gaza. We brought medical aid. We went to our rabbis who are in um, uh, occupied Palestine go to constantly in, into the um, West Bank. We go there. We, 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 we tell them. We, we, we embrace and suffer. We say we know that the, the root issue here, the root cause, and the way it, is, is the occupation of Palestine, there is no justification. And the, the suffering is because the ex existence of the state of Israel. The solution is not to make a wall between them. It's not to um, uh, all the other uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, twisted ideas that they're having over the world, to, more, to make a, a, a large prison called Gaza. Gaza. That's not the solution. The solution is to step back, the world should step back and realize that it's a mere a short history. The Zionism movement is a, a little bit over 100 years. Step back and realize that you've been duped. You've, you're, you're supporting a movement that's just going to continuously create bloodshed and hate and suffering and anti-Semitism. Remove this political flawed movement and the history will return to the natural way it was of Jews living together with Muslims and, and, and Christians that we've had for, for thousands of years, especially in the Muslim and Arab countries. We will be able to return to that life. And as Jews, we are yearning for this. So we should be able to give pitifully because uh, would have happened already, but we should somehow return the self-respect, the self-rule to the Palestinian people and show our gratitude for what's done for us. We can live together in harmony. And we pray to God that ultimately for the true what we pray for, what yearning, what the Zionists use, our yearning. We yearn to return to Jerusalem. That's what the giant Zionists use. But our returning to Jerusalem doesn't mean an occupation. It means the day as a Jewish person has to believe and hope that one day God will reveal His glory throughout the world. Well, all humanity will recognize one God. When that day comes, that's when our promise is that we will return. It won't be with force. It will be all nations, not becoming Jewish, but returning together to serve God. That's what the Jewish yearning is. Not the twisted Zionist concept of nationalism. We yearn that that day should come soon. God should help reveal His glory. We should serve Him in harmony together. Thank you. Yeah.